case featuring the craziest twists you have ever heard. The Linda Slayton case. A young mother was sexually assaulted and killed in her own house while her two sons slept nearby. One of the sons unwittingly posted a portrait of the young mother's killer on their wall. After Linda Slayton's sudden murder, her family slept in the same room as her children's grandfather maintained watch with a shotgun. However, they had no idea that an unexpected attacker was lurking much closer than they had thought. Welcome to Unsolved Crimes, where we feature cold cases, twisted cases and solved cases from around the world. If you like to watch similar contents, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications to watch our latest episodes. East of Tampa in Florida lies Lakeland, commonly referred to as the Swan City. Since 1923, swans have been sighted in Lakeland's lakes, earning this city the moniker Swan City. Over time, the moniker People Pets felt extremely appropriate for this city, since the residents of Lakeland referred to those swans as such. At any time of the day, you can observe these magnificent royal swans while taking in the beautiful vistas of this metropolis. Among the cities in Polk County, Lakeland is the biggest. But on September 4, 1981, Linda Slayton was sexually assaulted and strangled in her Lakeland, Florida home. The Slayton family, 31 years old Linda Slayton, a single mother of two sons, had just moved the family from Hartsale, Alabama to Lakeland, Florida in order to start over. She lived on a very limited budget and had help from the government. For her sons Jeffrey, 15, and Timothy, 12, Slayton had a reputation as a devoted and caring mother. On March 8, 1950, Linda Patterson Slayton was born. She became pregnant with her first child, Jeffrey Slayton, at the age of 16. She gave birth to a second son, Timothy Slayton, three years later. Soon after, she was successful in persuading Frank Slayton, the father of her two sons, to be married so that they could establish a stable family. A happy family, however, was a long cry from what she received. Frank turned out to be a nasty spouse who often mistreated her and the two children. He was plagued by alcoholism and addiction, and every time he drank, he would get aggressive. Jeff and Tim remember how their father would frequently transform into a monster. He was an aggressive drunk who would beat the three of them without mercy. Linda's decision to file for a divorce quickly crossed her thoughts and in 1974 she attained freedom. After nine tumultuous years of marriage, she filed for a divorce from Jeff and Tim's abusive father, Frank Slayton. Linda began her new life as a single mother of two sons who are now teenagers. As a loving mother balancing job and household duties, she did her best to support her family and be there for her sons. Clearly, she didn't have much financial capacity. Judy Butler, her sister, and she have a tight bond. The two sisters were well known for their close friendship and their weekly Friday morning coffee dates. The boys used their bicycles to get about the neighborhood since the family didn't have a car. Coach Joseph Mills, who coached Timothy's football team, frequently provided transportation to and from practices. The family visited Linda's parents frequently because they lived just about 10 miles away. A week prior to September 4th, Linda was getting ready to welcome her mother into her house. She wanted her mother to move in because she believed that her presence would help organize the home and make it feel more comfortable. Judy, her sister, frequently came over to see her as well. The sisters would enjoy the time together over a hot cup of coffee when she came to visit. The Discovery Judy Butler came to the Slayton apartment early on Friday, September 4th, 1981 for coffee. Butler pounded on the door repeatedly, but no one ever opened it. As she circled the apartment's exterior, she observed that the sister's bedroom window screen was missing. Butler peered through the window and saw Linda lying on her bed with her clothes turned the other way around and a wire coat hanger wrapped around her neck. Butler was inconsolable when a maintenance worker for an apartment building, later identified as John Allen, came across and dialed 911. The scene was inspected by investigators and first responders. They discovered the entrance to be locked. To enter the apartment, they utilized a window. 
Where they saw Linda Slayton laid out on her bed, she was completely exposed, since the hem of her dress was pulled up and the front of her dress was pulled down. Her vaginal region had blood on it. Her neck was wrapped in a wire coat hanger. There were no abnormalities or indications of a struggle other than her underpants and shoes, which were on the floor. Timothy and Jeffrey Slayton were discovered by emergency personnel unharmed when they were sleeping upstairs. However, not before Timothy saw the scene of his mother's murder, they removed the boys from the residence. I witnessed the crime scene. He would later claim, I saw the crime scene. It still burned in my brain today. The investigation of Linda Slayton's death. The police were obliged to map out her entire family tree in order to figure out who might have been at fault. Frank Slayton, Linda's ex-husband, was the first person suspected. She claimed Frank had an aggressive nature when she divorced him in 1975. In addition to abusing his family, he neglected them. He was definitely going to be considered a person of interest in this investigation. But when the authorities investigated his whereabouts the night Linda was killed, they took him in for questioning. They were still skeptical of him even after learning that he was at home in Alabama when Linda was killed. Jeff Slayton, Linda's son, was the second suspect. But why did the authorities consider him a suspect? Jeff Slayton and his mother got into a violent altercation before Linda was killed. Although they were quite close, Jeff and his mother had a distant connection. Being the oldest son, he experienced the stress of growing up with an abusive father and eventually a single mother. There were moments when Jeff and his mother would frequently annoy one another. He always made sure, though, to make up for it. Before going to bed the night before the murder, Jeff made up with his mother. He was interrogated by the police on the incident and he was even instructed to undergo two polygraph tests. The police removed him from the list of suspects when he passed. The third suspect on the list was Linda's boyfriend, who had begun seeing Linda, single mother at the time. She and her children were close with the white man who won't be named, but he was found not guilty after a polygraph test and background investigation by the police. They had ran out of suspects by this point, but in September 2001, they received a tip. There was a report that a 24 years old man has committed a crime very similar to Linda's murder almost a year earlier. He was Jimmy Ulmer. At the time, he was connected to a crime in which he nearly killed a 10 years old girl by pulling her through the bedroom window. He had been sentenced to 80 years in prison, according to a police check on him. Additionally, the startling similarity between his misdeeds and Linda's situation, and to top it off, Linda and Jimmy were both discovered to be living in the same apartment building at the time of the murder. He was considered the main suspect by the police due to the evidence that was found against him. The investigation was ongoing when Jimmy passed away, thus a DNA match was not possible. For the test to be conducted, they would have to dig up his body. It's a good thing Jimmy's mother agreed to a DNA test and provided a sample. In contrast, there was no match when the results were received. Who else might have murdered Linda if not the family or the criminal who lived next door? Days had by this point in Lakeland became weeks, then weeks into months. Detectives also looked at other people, but nobody was even put on trial. And without any fresh leads, the case became cold. Now, what is a cold case? A tangible crime scene or accident site is referred to as a cold case if it hasn't been fully solved. The major characteristic of a cold case is that the incident surrounding the crime site has lingered unresolved or unsolved to the extent that it is no longer the focus of a current criminal investigation. Due to this extended unsolved status, no new information can be learned through criminal investigation. The only new information that could surface in a cold case would come from new witness testimony the re-evaluation of tangible evidence, the re-examination of archives, and any new activities of the suspect, which would include repeated murders or other offenses that are related to the original criminal matter. Also, to re-evaluate the causes in the ongoing cold case, new technical techniques that were created after the crime may be applied to the remaining evidence. Characteristics of a cold case a cold case is generally associated with major felony offenses or violent behavior such as rape or murder. 
A cold case, unlike the majority of unsolved minor offenses, is usually not subject to a statute of limitations because of its violent subject matter. Aside from violent crimes, a disappearance or missing person may be deemed a cold case if the victim has not been seen or heard from for an extended period of time. Some cases are classified as cold cases when a case that initially appeared to be solved is reopened as a result of the presence or discovery of fresh evidence that unmistakably disproves the initial suspects. Strangely often, this circumstance arises as a result of a miscarriage of justice. When the crime in issue is uncovered after the occurrence occurred, as is frequently the case when detectives find human remains, more cold cases will develop. A new living reality had to be accepted by the Slayton brothers. Only their grandparents, Clarence and Margaret Harris, remained after their mother passed away. After holding a funeral for Linda while the investigation was ongoing, her parents and sons quickly resumed their normal lives and routines. The brothers re-enrolled in school. They began to forget what had transpired at 303 North Brunel Parkway as time went on. The two brothers who had just lost their mother grew up to turn into men who loved and cared for their own families in the years that followed. In the years after getting married, Jeff had two kids. Likewise, Tim began a family and got married. Both brothers kept in touch with the Lakeland detectives over time to inquire about the status of their mother's case. Jeff Slayton still remembers the evening when Linda was killed. It's quite challenging to live like that, and I didn't hear anything. Even Linda's neighbors claimed they heard nothing out of the ordinary the night she was killed. Though Jeff and Tim had both established successful careers for themselves, they still made sure that the case was progressing. No matter how many detectives we had to go through over here, Tim says in an interview, 17 years had gone since Linda's passing, and we were going to let them know that we are still alive and that we still want to know who killed our mother. However, the police kept looking into the matter despite the passing of more than 10 years. Sergeant Edgar Pickett had resigned by 1998 and the Slayton case had been given to the new investigating team. Unidentified DNA from the Slayton case that had been gathered back in 1981 was discovered by Detective Brad Grice when he was examining the pieces of evidence in this case. He forwarded this to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, FDLE, which is also known as the state's primary crime lab. The FDLE crime lab was able to dissect and create a complete DNA profile of Linda Slayton's killer by the year 1999. The unidentifiable DNA profile from the Slayton case sample that Detective Grice submitted in 2005 to the FBI's National DNA Database where it was continuously cross-referenced with fresh DNA samples submitted. Throughout the course of his investigation, he eliminated dozens of candidates using DNA proof. He spent 17 years working on the Slayton case, but he retired in 2015. The Slayton case was given to new detectives Russell Hurley and Tammy Hathcock after Detective Grice. The FDLE has created a groundbreaking technique that may assist in identifying any unidentified DNA. Detective Tammy discovered three years into the inquiry. Taking advantage of the opportunity, detectives dispatched C.C. Moore, a genealogist who worked for the FDLE. A list of individuals whose DNA the mystery killer shared was generated by the public genealogy website hosted by C.C. Moore, Jet Match. She used birth certificates, marriage certificates, death certificates, and social media to build a genetic family tree after uploading the anonymous Slayton case DNA there. As the inquiry progressed, C.C. Moore built three family tree branches for the killer, which assisted her in locating the individual most likely to be responsible for killing Linda Slayton. The family tree constructed using the DNA profile revealed that he was undoubtedly the individual who killed Linda Slayton. The twist took an unexpected turn at this point, shocking Tim and Jeff Slayton as well. This was the image at Tim's bedroom wall and Joseph Clinton Mills, 
sometimes known as Coach Joe, can be seen standing just above Tim's shoulder. He was probably the person who killed Linda Slayton, according to the family tree created using the DNA profile, which was revealed after learning the killer's identity. Recent Developments Since 1981, significant progress has been achieved in DNA technology. A fascinating development in the study of homicides is the practice of genetic genealogy. When Linda Slayton's killer was finally apprehended in 2018, it was thanks to this method. Russell and Detective Tammy continued the investigation into Joseph Mills' past, where they discovered certain offenses he had done. One of them was using a fake will to conduct grand theft. The cops did obtain his palm and fingerprints, even though he was never charged for it. You may also recall that at the crime site, Sergeant Edgar Pickett found a palm print on the windowsill. This implied that the relatives of the deceased might finally find resolution to the unsolved matter, which had been open for more than 40 years. At this point, detectives found a match when they compared Mills' palm print to those collected in 1981 from Linda Slayton's windowsill. Through genetic genealogy, forensics were able to link Timothy Slayton's football coach Joseph Clinton Mills to be the DNA profile that had been created based on the evidence obtained from the crime in 1981. Joseph Mills' arrest On December 12, 2018, Joseph Clinton Mills was taken into custody by investigators. He was accused of first-degree murder in Linda Slayton's passing by the prosecution. Additionally, they accused Mills of breaking and entering and sexual battery. Mills first admitted to having little or no knowledge of her death throughout the interview before later changing his narrative. He claimed Linda had invited him over to her house for some rough consensual sex. She already had the wire coat hanger wrapped around her neck when he arrived. Investigators quickly proclaimed this to be untrue, and prosecutors later demonstrated this using previously uncovered evidence. The Aftermath After their mother passed away, the Slayton brothers Jeffrey and Timothy were raised by their maternal grandparents. They were a nice family, according to both guys. Both of them have acknowledged that it was difficult for them not to constantly be on the lookout for the assailant, fearing that they would be targeted again. The fact that Timothy had a photo of his recreational football squad over the years had a significant long-term effect. On the wall of Timothy's bedroom was a picture of him with his coach, Joseph Mills. Well, how do you feel about this unique case? Please let us know what you think in the comment section below. And please like and share the video if you want to see more such true crime content. Make sure to subscribe to our channel. We hope to see you in our next video. Bye-bye.